So tonight we have John Goodwin here. John Goodwin is a principal engineer at Metabolon. Uh, he's just talking a little bit about some of the jobs that are available at Metabolon and posted a link out to the jobs channel in Slack. So please take your time to go check that out. Um, John's going to be here to talk with us about Docker and he's using the .NET stack, right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, what I'll be showing is a little bit of C-sharp, but hardly any. So if you don't know C-sharp, you know, don't feel intimidated. All the commands I'm going to do are reproducible. Um, and we won't generally be doing C-sharp, but I'll be showing a, a how to create a harness around it so you can take someone else's application and help them to create uh, automated testing for it. Awesome. So there were some instructions that were sent out. Has anybody, has everyone gone through and had a chance to check those out? Um, if not, please go spend a couple minutes, try and cram, or use our the use this time as we record it, observe it, and then you can do that after the fact. So John, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Susan. All right, so, um, yeah, so here's the presentation that I've got. Uh, this, this is done in a lab format. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, I have been in meetings where uh, they've gone for about 10 minutes before everybody, someone pipes up and says, oh, I can't see anything. Are you supposed to be sharing? Um, so in any case, um, th this is my personal email, if you choose to email me. So I figured I'd go over the agenda. Um, quick reminder, I'll provide some resources to, to download. Uh, and then as, after that, I figured it would be helpful to describe the goals of this lab so that uh, it'll be helpful, I think, to understand what we're gonna cover, what we're not gonna cover. Um, and then motivations, like why did I even put this together? Um, and uh, then I was also hoping to cover the how to create a new project, uh, a short introduction to Postgres. So if you're not familiar with Postgres, I kind of talk about it briefly here. It's not extensive, just short uh, explanation. Uh, how to add a test project, bring that in, how to add migrations. And so what I mean by migrations is just simply how to change the state of the database, adding tables and things like that, and then how to bind that in. And so let's get going. So if you don't have the .NET Core 3.1 SDK yet, uh, and you're hoping to cram, like uh, Susan said, you can just jump on here and get yourself a copy. Um, you'll need the Docker um, runtime. And so on your computer, what this will do in Windows is it will create a virtual machine and uh, it will, or on Mac, it'll create a virtual machine and it runs Linux. And then that Linux uh, machine will basically be responsible for um, running the Docker runtime. And so it, it's basically just a service that runs uh, some of what we're going to be doing, which will help to create the Docker Compose. So in short, you basically just need a server that's going to act as the host for these tests. The nice thing is that this platform will give you, um, it'll give you basically a clean slate because of the design every time you run it. And so this will give us the opportunity to kind of reset the test environment. So this is, this is one of the struggles that, that sometimes you might have in setting up test environments. All right, so then these are the three primary images. There, there is actually like one more, but it should come down automatically uh, when, when we reference it. So these are the main ones here though. And while all of these slides are actually available online, um, it's by design, and I hope it doesn't come back to sting me, but it's by design that I'm not sharing it ahead of time because I feel like you'll learn a lot more if you type it in with your own two hands. So hopefully that doesn't cause you to, uh, to, to get upset with me. All right, so if you get interested in learning a lot more about Docker specifically or Kubernetes or other kinds of products, there's actually a really neat website called Katakoda. So Katakoda, um, they have drills and, and exercises and tutorials, and they load up a, an empty resource for you to use. Uh, those resources can be used um, to create um, an empty environment to, to, to run all the tutorials. It's pretty nice. Uh, most of the tutorials I've seen are, are, are quite good. 
Um, and then in the case that you're not familiar with Postgres, which is a database platform, uh, we, we can go here. All right. All right, so quickly on the goals, um, I, I wanted to emphasize that, that this is for hands-on. I mean, I've been to a lot of you know, talks where the person talks for an hour, they basically show you something where it, you know, you know, they worked hard on it, um, but they compress it down and they show you basically what feels like magic in the course of 30 minutes to an hour, right? And in those kinds of talks, I feel like it's almost like a performance and you walk away, you, you clapped for the person, but you aren't really that much better off at doing what you can do. Um, and so that, that was what I wanted to change about at this talk and, and offering it in kind of a workshop format. Um, I'm hoping to sideline some of the discussions, you know, like, can I make this run on my Raspberry Pi? You know, maybe, uh, can, can I run it on my, you know, Casio watch? Uh, that kind of stuff, we'll set that aside for now. And um, we'll talk briefly uh, about the database and kind of some of the neat advantages you can get out of Postgres. And uh, then a short talk on um, what, what we're doing with the emphasis here. So the emphasis, if you look at it, there's a lot of different ways to do testing, right? So you can do unit tests, you can you know, peer review and all of this sort of stuff. Um, there's also different ways of running tooling or designs for how you, how you strategically create your software. So if you're you know, familiar with uh, like BDD or test-driven development. And so this is actually more, in my opinion, like a pattern talk, right? And so what I'm hoping to do is rather than giving you um, like design patterns of, of like do this, like uh, the MVC design pattern or MVVM, and th those are good. They have their own place. Um, what I'm hoping to do is to give you a, this is a way of doing work or a style of doing work that hopefully can decrease your, your uh, risk at any given moment that you're working through a program. Um, or through a project. All right, so kind of what were the motivations here? So I, I wrote that technology is hard. And when I started working at Metabolon, uh, we were changing a lot of different software all at once. And one of the, the, the problems with that is that it kind of creates a recipe for disaster uh, if you can't recreate the environments. And one of the, the really uh, enormous challenges that we had with creating the environments is that we had some of the environments needed data. And then like in the case that you need a database because it's just too hard to, like there's a limited amount of value that you get out of mocking everything. And so like at some point you really need to test it connected to a database and so forth. And if, you, if that process is too expensive, what will happen is you'll create a database and you'll leave it up. And when you create a database and you leave it up, then the state that the database is in might not be the state that you expect. It might be done by a person. They might be troubleshooting some. Uh, it might be like code that got abandoned and, but it, it's still sitting around on the database. So there's a lot of reasons why technology just ultimately is hard. And this um, process I felt was a great strategy on trying to um, create a process around bringing down some of those costs, bringing down uh, the barriers for infrastructure, being able to create infrastructure in the case that you have enough computer resources locally, create those resources on your own computer. And, and you know, computers have gotten to be where they're cheaper and cheaper and you can have more and more resources. So you can create these on your own local machine or you can create them potentially on a shared server. But um, it, it makes it very reproducible. So there's, um, there, there's a lot of, a lot that I felt like I had to learn in order to be able to do this properly. And so I felt like, well, if it was a lot for me, I wonder how many people are like me and would benefit from what I had learned so far. And so while I, I might feel that I have gotten to a certain state, I'm by no means someone who can go out tomorrow and program my own Docker and just say, you know, uh, you know I don't need this platform because I can do it better. Um, so th there's a fair bit more for me to learn on all fronts um, you know, with any of these uh, different platforms. And so we'll just move on here. So I figured let's start step one is creating a new ASP.NET project. And so if you installed the .NET Core runtime, 
um, the, I'm sorry, the um, SDK, you should be able to do this command. And so what I'll do here, I'll actually do it with you. All right, so how's the font size? Is that all right? Yeah, I mean, nice size, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's, that's one of my pet peeves is uh, tiny fonts when people share. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a directory. So I'll go into, um, I have a folder that I usually use for source code and I'll make a folder, um, we'll call it uh, TSQA workshop. So empty folder, starting from there, along with everybody else. All right, so uh, .NET new solution, and we'll give it a name of TSQA API. So. Looks about right. All right, so what did that do? It created what's called a solution file. So for any of you who are not familiar with the Microsoft.NET uh, ecosystem, basically you can think of a solution file almost like, um, like a file filled with bookmarks, right? And so the idea is that like all of these bookmarks, if you will, are the different projects that as a set have some sort of logical meaning together. Um, so this solution file, it's a little bit of an odd duck. Uh, we can look at it. Um, and I say odd duck just because it doesn't match any of the other file formats that um, uh, Microsoft uses for their other like project files and different things. Um, so this basically just says like all of the different um, configurations that you have, like debug, release, different things like that. And it has the projects in it. So you can tell there's no projects in it because we don't have any projects yet. All right. So let's go ahead and add a project. We'll add a web API project. And so this web API project, the idea here is that this is uh, an API or an application programming interface. Uh, basically, you, you send it a request, uh, much like the way you're, you open a website in your browser. You send it a request, and then it just gives you a response. And uh, this version of the API, generally, it will not normally be uh, the version that you would go to in a web browser. This would be one that you would talk to with software or a client of some kind. So let's go ahead and create that. Okay. And the default that um, .NET has is when you create the projects, it will create them in a folder with the same name as the project to put all of its files in there. And so if that's not totally evident here, you can see um, here we have the API uh, folder and here was the solution. I just happened to name them the same. Um, it, it won't hurt that they're named the same, uh, but they are separate uh, entities. So if we want to um, look inside of the folder and see what was in, it created in there, it created just a simple stub version of the project. Um, we won't be generally changing too much of what's going on inside of here. Okay. All right, we're gonna add that to the solution. All right, so adding it to the solution, we'll just basically add it to that solution file. So um, if we look inside that solution file, you'll see that it's a little bit longer now. And it has a reference to that um, TSQA API CS project, okay? So now that we get the idea how this file works, we probably won't look at it anymore, but. All right. So next, 
<clears throat> pardon me, uh, we'll do a quick uh, introduction to Postgres. So out of curiosity, how many uh, folks have used Postgres? I have. Who was that? Mike. Was Mike? Mike. Any anybody else? Is is this one pretty new for folks? I've used it as well. Okay. I've used it for a while. Yeah. So it sounds like that some of you folks might have used it longer than I am. Um, I actually only started using Postgres within the last year. So um, I was using a, a form of it a little bit. We started trying uh, experimenting with Citus. Uh, it's an interesting uh, subject if you wanna go read about it. Uh, it's basically horizontally scaled Postgres. Um, but um, Postgres is an interesting database. It, it's actually in a lot of ways similar to uh, Transact SQL if you've ever used that for other folks that uh, have used other databases. Um, there were some things that I felt were really interesting about the proposition with Postgres. So first of all, uh, it's it's available uh, open source. You can uh, change the code if you want to. You can run it uh, the, uh, for, on your own with no licensing fees if you choose to. Um, they have a lot of different features. So one that was an interesting feature that uh, this was actually the first database I had used that was a relational database, but that also had features for JSON. Um, so this was pretty new to me. I'd never used a database that had built-in JSON support. Um, they have a lot of different plugins and different uh, features from third parties that you can plug into and, and use. Um, they have this thing here, the write-ahead log. So if anybody's familiar with a transaction log, uh, to my understanding, this is largely the same. Um, and so, yeah, this it's a very, rich database. Uh, seems to be pretty reliable. A lot of people have used it. Um, you do want to make sure that if you're using it a lot that you have some notion of how to deal with your uh, write ahead log because it will eventually grow and fill up and use up your all your disk space. So uh, that's worth knowing. All right, so let me go back. So this one was neat. Uh, so this is the feature matrix. Um, the nice thing, I, I don't know if other people have looked at it, but the, the nice thing I felt about this was that you can see when a particular feature came into play. So I know a lot of us uh, might work at a place where they're a little bit reluctant to bring in like the newest and latest of everything. Um, but like you learn about a feature for the first time, you might be excited to try it out and you know use it to solve your problem. Uh, this this feature matrix will help you to find out whether or not it's on the version that you're using. So I thought that was pretty cool, and I just found about out about this the other day. All right, so All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to create an empty Postgres database. Um, that sounds a lot scarier than it is. Uh, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, a Docker Compose file, and we're going to bring it down, and it will have just enough instructions in it um, to create um, the uh, Postgres database. And so I'll show you what I mean. So this is a curl command. Why, why don't I, this is a little bit much. So why don't I paste this into the chat here? And so for those of you not using bash, uh, you will need to remove this and this. Uh, so in bash, this is a line continuation. Um, but just kind of walking through what I'm doing here, the idea here is I, I use bash. And if you have a different 
way of getting it. Uh, you could download this in your browser if you chose to. But basically, I'm running this command to say curl, which is uh, basically, a, uh, you can think of it as like a command line version of a browser. Go get me uh, a file. And I want to output that file as this, this file name. And I'm going to um, get this particular URL. Okay. And then after that, I use this sed command to replace. And the sed command is just to swap out. I just want to change this line. So I want to change image Postgres for image Postgres 12.4. And it's just to make sure that we're you know, using the exact same one is all I'm trying to do here. Uh, and then I want to do that for this file, Docker Compose. And so, um, and then the last bit here is uh, Docker Compose up, which will create a Postgres database. So let's go ahead and do that now. All right, so I have this. I, I wasn't wanting it to be called stack, so let's let's change that file name. Uh, what I actually wanted is I wanted this file to be called yeah, Docker Compose. All right. Um, so then the next part here is I wanted to just swap out the request for Postgres to be a specific version. And then we'll ask for Docker Compose up. And so that one's So Docker Compose up, the whole gist with Docker Compose up is it will take the Docker Compose file and bring it up. And actually, before we do that, let's take a look at it. Um, so it's a very simple file. Um, it just says uh, here we want this specific version of a Docker Compose file. And if you're familiar with YAML files, the spaces are important, uh, basically uh, provides nesting. So we want this image of Postgres, uh, always restart it, and then uh, use this password. And then this is an admin um, image that goes with it. Uh, I wouldn't worry about that too much right now. So Docker compose up. All right. So we, we have a database. Um, this database is running. Now, while it's running, because of the way that I ran Docker compose up, there is a dash D version, if memory serves, for the command for Docker Compose that will run it in the background. Uh, the way I ran it, I ran it interactively. So what, what's happening is it's using my, uh, my console right now. So if I just want a second console, I'll just open up a, a, another one here. And so we'll do um, the next part. So what I'm showing here is that we can connect to prove that we have a Postgres database. So what this Docker Compose exec command does is this is basically going to say, create a program inside of Docker Compose, uh, the, the space, right? We're going to connect to this thing called a database. And so if we flip back for a moment and we look, and here I'll just do it in this show. Uh, If we look here, there's one of these services and it's called DB. And because we called it DB, that's why in this exec command, I have DB here. So then the command to be executed is psql-u postgres. And so we'll go ahead and run this. All right, so what this dash u is, is it, uh, it, it means uh, request the username of Postgres is what this effectively means. Okay, so 
we, we have a prompt inside of Postgres for the PSQL program. Uh, at this point, we can run some commands to see if we can talk to that database, right? So uh, we can select the version. Now, all of the commands that you type inside of the PSQL um, client need to be semicolon terminated to tell it that you're done typing the command. And so here we get to see the version of Postgres that was installed. And let's go ahead and look at the current timestamp. Select current, oops, I think it's, not the right submit issue. So we can get the time from the server. And then this one, if you're not familiar with it, um, basically lists the tables. Um, so that one is one example where you don't have to actually do the semicolon for whatever reason. So here you can see the different schemas and um, the, of what where, where the table or object came from. Here's the table or object, uh, the type of object it is, and who owns that object. And so um, these are tables that come with the database. Uh, I didn't create them specially. They just were there as a matter of installing Postgres. Okay, so I'm not going to explain what each one of those is in this session, but just be aware that they exist in there already and they're available. So once you're done in here, uh, if you don't need to use uh, this prompt anymore, you can type an exit and it will exit out of the PSQL program. All right. So we've proven that the Postgres database is there and it's up, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna add a test project. And so what we'll do here is we'll add, um, have any of you used XUnit or uh, JUnit or things like that? A anybody here? Affirmative. Okay. Any, anybody else? A little bit of JUnit. Okay. Yeah, so XUnit is very similar to, to in some ways to JUnit. Um, I think they have one that they they call NUnit, which is closer, um, but very similar kind of notion. This idea that you make these tiny functions, uh, ideally tiny, uh, and the, the functions just run a small part of your application. And the idea is that the testing framework kind of helps you to create all the rest of the plumbing and you get to focus on just writing the tests. And so that's what we're going to create here. So dot add new X unit and we'll do aim TSQA dot tests. Uh, let's do API. All right. So this will create a new project. It'll create it as a test project. Um, so here we go. We have, this is the web API, and here's the test project, okay? So we're gonna add that to our uh, solution, just, just like the main web API, so .NET solution, add uh, TSQA API.tests. So we've added, and so now we can actually try the tests, so .NET test. So running this in the root with it uh, hooked to the solution file, you'll notice it says that it found one uh, test file and it ran it and it passed. And so this came out of test run for TSQ, uh, QA API tests. And so it did find the test project and started trying to run tests inside of it. All right. So this is a pattern that I'm kind of giving to you that I've used for my projects. And what I've done here is I'm creating a Docker file that helps to describe how you would create a program that goes with your main one that's 100% only designed to run your integration tests, okay? And so this project um, or this, this uh, file, you can think of it as kind of like 
um, perform these steps and it will give you uh, a system set up to do what it is I'm trying to have done if you've not done Docker files before. And so what that looks like here is start from an image or an installer that's, that's considered well known given this name, okay? And so this will actually go out to Microsoft's uh, Docker you know, uh, services where they share it and it will pull in an image uh, known in this, uh, by this name, okay? Then it will create a working directory. So you can think of it as kind of like, when you don't say what folder you're in, what folder am I in? And so here it's just app. And so copy dot to dot. So what that means is whatever the current folder is that I'm running this, um, copy all the folders to the current folder inside of the platform. Where is the current folder? Slash app from within inside of this image. If it helps to think about it, you can kind of think of it as a like a virtual machine almost. It's not really a virtual machine, but if it helps you to think about it, you can think of it similar to one that only has .NET installed. And we basically, we're just layering into that install app with all of your project files. So once you have that, um, run this command, and we've yet to create it, but I'll show you what goes in it. Uh, run this command, uh, run tests, um, or, or rather run the command to make it executable, and then um, set an environment variable of connection strings Postgres to an empty string. For now, that's uh, uh, we have a way to overwrite it later. And then um, here's the command that will be run, okay? So for now, Ugh, things butchering my format here. Um, yeah. Well, it this one's hopefully short enough. People can type it. All right, I, th I think I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna use my escape hatch here. I'm gonna I'm gonna go go ahead and share where the uh, the things are. If you if you're not familiar with GitHub, uh, you'll find me on there as J.H. Goodwin. So if you go to github.com, J.H. Goodwin, it's the first repo. And all my notes are in there. So if you want to see the slides, they're inside of export. Or if you want to just click into it and look at the markdown files, they're in here as well. So github.com, J.H. Goodwin. And we are here at the integration test Docker file. Okay. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create integration test. Oh, that's why it's messing up here. All right, so if you're not familiar with what I've done, I, I'm, this is basically a here doc. This is just a syntax that you can use to inline a document. Um, so basically I'm saying um, output this to a file and what I'm outputting is the contents of this, this file minus the EOF stuff. So if we look at it, Uh, we'll see it has the contents that, that I have in there. Okay. All right. 
All right, so this is um, the run test file. And so if you're not familiar with Bash, Bash is the born again shell, uh, uh, not written by Jason Bourne, um, but I do believe the man's name was Stephen Bourne, I wanna say. All right, so what this does is this is just a real simple run test script. Um, if you're familiar with make files, you might prefer uh, a make file. The idea here is that I just want a simple way to invoke my script um, so that it can be run. And the, in my script that I want to run, I want to run .NET test. For now, that's it. Uh, the only thing that this exit does afterwards is it just takes this uh, special syntax of dollar sign question mark, if you're not familiar with bash, means whatever the exit code is of uh, that was just run, put that in here as though it were a variable. And then this exit command just exits the script, providing the um, exit code that was that, that's provided here. And so in the case that .NET test successfully runs and there's no uh, errors, this exit should return zero. In the case that there is an error, this exit should return uh, like a one or two or whatever the exit code is. All right, so. Now, you saw in the Docker command, uh, the uh, integration test Docker file, uh, that I'm specifically setting this um, chmod uh, plus x. What this does is it makes the file executable. Um, this works because of the way Linux understands the, um, th this is called um, a shebang. And so this, this syntax here basically says, use this program to figure out how to run the rest of it. And uh, when we make it executable, uh, Linux is smart enough to be able to uh, get this command to run the rest of these commands uh, inside. Uh, by making it executable, what I've done is I made it easier for me to consume without having to be in the integration test or in the Docker file. Th this is actually one of the, the kind of things that I s somewhat believe in, is I think that you should create test runtimes and test harnesses that are easy for you to consume and easy for your, your automation to consume. The idea that it's only easy for you or only easy for your automation, in my opinion, is, is a sign that it, maybe it's not the best design that you're going to land on. All right. Um, so what I'd like to do is tear down that other cluster. So let's see here. So here I just did uh, control C. Now control C um, will stop it, but down is actually different from stopping it. So uh, down actually removes it as well. It stops it and removes it. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is now that we have this integration test, we're going to basically add that integration test um, to the um, We're going to add that integration test to the Docker Compose. Um, so what that will do is it'll basically take that version of our of an application whose purpose in life is to just purely test your to to run your integration tests. Uh, it'll take it and add it to that Compose. And so let's go ahead and what what I'm doing here is I'm going to open up a, an editor. It makes it easier for me to just copy those elements out.
All right, so that looks like we're going to go to the Docker file. So if you're using um, this method, the double um, redirects means to append. All right, so, so if you look here, uh, we basically added this section here, test. And it says, use this Docker file to be able to do the tests. Um, this context, this basically means what folder am I interested in um, getting the files from that go inside of this Docker file? So when any of the statements about files, like where, where does it need to get them from? And then this last bit depends on DB. This is used to make sure that the test does not run before DB has had a chance to run. So we're going to run the cluster. So this Docker compose file, um, by saying we want the exit code from the test, what this will do is it will return uh, the same exit code from test will be the return of this Docker compose. So this would allow you to chain uh, tests. Uh, so in the case that you're creating automation and you want to chain it to like the output of the, the test, like this, the exit code will match that now. Okay, so it took a little bit for the database to be considered up, but once it was, uh, this test ran, and then when it did, it returned a status code of zero. So not magic yet because it's not actually connecting to that database, but like still, I think progress. Right. All right. So next, we're going to add migrations. And so if you're not familiar with the notion of migrations, um, I have a link here, uh, and, and they're available in the slides. Um, but the migrations is this idea that you have a stepwise way of changing the database that you're working with. Um, so here, we're going to uh, add the Fluent Migrator um, CLI. Uh, it, like, if you're going to run it locally, this is what you would need to do. Um, in the case that you're just running it inside of the test, uh, we'll, we'll be able to do it from there. All right, so we're going to add migrations uh, uh, as a new project. And so this one is a little bit different from the, the other ones that we've done so far. And so the migrations project is done as a class library. Um, that class library just means that it's a library that's consumed and it's not intended to be used as a program that runs by itself. That's all that means. So we'll add that to our solution. And then we're going to add um, the to the migrations project the package of the Pluent to Migrator. And this will allow us to do migrations. All right. So here. Um, if you're using the GitHub repo, um, there is a small test that I'm adding to prove that the migrations work. And so we're going to add that. And so that test is um, being added to a file called psqa api.migrations migration initial. All right, and so just walking briefly through what's going on here, um, it basically says 
uh, use the Fluent Migrator, bring those libraries in so that they're more convenient. I don't, I don't have to type Fluent Migrator in front of everything. Um, I bring that in. And how this works is that there's a migration and you number them, right? This initial migration is a pattern that I use in my own projects. And I just use it to prove that migrations can work. Can your system talk to that other database? Do you have enough rights to be able to change the database? You know, these kinds of things. And so I'm basically running a create statement and then I do an execute statement. Um, you know, you could run other tests in here if you chose to. Uh, so I create a temporary table. Um, I have like two columns in it, not super important what's going on, except that this is an example of one thing that should work. And then I execute the SQL statement of um, uh, tr trying to, well, this one I probably should just create a um, select statement. Um, uh, but then after the end, um, uh, do a delete. And so then this would allow you to be able to uh, verify that your statements are running as you expect. Yeah. All right, so. All right, so we have the file. So then the next step is that we're going to um, update the Docker Compose to have this new entry at the bottom. So this environment uh, connection strings um, Postgres database. And so if you remember um, the, ver the sample that was provided uh, they recommended, uh, or they just gave, gave an example of how to provide example as the password. And so that's what we're going to do. So all together, it looks like this now. Okay. All right. So then next, what we're going to do is we're going to update the integration test because now the integration test isn't just to run the tests only, we need to run migrations. Now, if you chose to, you could move this into a script. Uh, you could have like, you know, maybe two scripts, one that runs the migrations, one that runs the test. Totally up to you. Uh, this is just how I chose to do it for this, uh, this demonstration. So, So basically what, here, what I'm doing here is this is the migration uh, d migrator DLL, and we're going to run uh, the install of the .NET uh, or the fluent migrator. Um, we're setting a few environment variables, and then we're going to run the tests. Okay. So now you may have guessed that the tests will need to expand just a little bit. So now it's going to look like this. And this is basically uh, restore the packages that you have, uh, do a build, uh, do the um, .NET Fluent Migrator, which is the tool, run the migrate sub command of that tool. Uh, for Here's the information for the database. So here's the, um, the user, the password, and so forth. Right.
All right. So now we're going to um, restart and run. So what that looks like, and you can make a make file or a small script or something like that to make this easier. Um, I've actually found it helpful to do the down and then the up. And the reason is that the down gets rid of all of the resources and you start from a completely blank slate. And so if you find that to be a helpful tool, uh, you know, feel free to, to steal that from me. Uh, in the case that I do the down, you'll notice that I do it with the semicolon in bash. This means always run it and then whatever the outcome is, you know, success or not, run the next command. And so the reason why I do that is in the case that let's say you never ran it, uh, the up, uh, down will actually fail, right? So rather than make a complicated thing, I just said run down all the time and if, whether it works or not, then run the test. Um, maybe not the thoroughness that you would prefer, but uh, it, it does function, so. So here it's running the migrations. And there you go. Hmm. I'll have to check why this is happening. My guess is this is not supposed to happen. And you see here, um, the exit code gave uh, an error code. And so like th this is an example where it ran, it went to completion, and it didn't work, and it caught this error. And so um, before, the, before we leave, I'll see if I can um, help to troubleshoot that. All right. Um, and then the last thing I have here, let's see here. I have in this file, uh, if you're looking at the GitHub, it's in the addendum. Um, where, where did I move that? So what, what I'm going to do here is we'll open up the integration test Docker file and let's do actually I'm sorry it's the Docker compose which is mislabeled. Let's update the test. Now I'll, I'll update the repo so it has this version that you're seeing here. And so what, what we're doing here is this part's the same, but we're just adding to use a specific user. Uh, you can pass in which user you're gonna use, otherwise it'll use root. Um, oh, okay, I see what I was intending to show here. So this was some a, a pattern that I used um, in the past for doing the output. And so you might say like, I want the test results. So code coverage files, things like that. Uh, this would be closer to the pattern that you would use here. And that's what I was trying to illustrate. And so what would end up happening is that you would have a folder that would get created um, that if you didn't have one created, it would create one called test results. Uh, if you created a head, you could create it with the permissions that you want. Um, but then you could create a test results folder so that you could see what the outputs look like. That's what I was intending to show here. And so that's why I didn't put it as part of the main demo. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's the gist here. Uh, the idea being that we can just like keep changing it at this point and running this basic command over and over until we get the
to test success. And as as we saw, um, I guess in a, in a roundabout way, the failure here means that it worked, right? So, so this is most of what I had. Does anybody have any questions? I think uh, we are all dig digesting the information. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. Um, so the the thing that I I felt like that this gave me is it gave me the minimum of what does it take to um, have a project that has potentially one more dependency than the project, right? Because that that's easy. I have it one app, the app by itself. It doesn't need anything else. How do you test it, right? That's easy. But now this app needs other apps. Did I write those apps? Do I, am I trying to test that app or just the way that I've configured it, things like that? This is an environment where those integration tests, Docker Compose really can help to solve that problem. It's like, how do I test the combination of apps coming together? And um, the nice thing is that with this idea of resetting it, you can reset it over and over and go back to the beginning, blank slate, Try it again. Install all the files. Do it exactly this way. Run it. See what happens. And um, this workflow will give you, you know, the, like a zero basically if it's working, or the error code if it's not. So, do I uh, understand correctly that uh, the way you've set it up, that you take the database down and then you bring it back up again, and it's always going to have start with the same state, no matter what it, what you did to it before. It's like throwing it away and then starting it over from a known state. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent correct. So um, the reason why you're getting that is that basically the design of Docker is um, have. I don't know if I'm just too old, but I I've been in the computers back when it used to be like said that. How you would like, like a simple way of installing the program is this program was so simple it had a, what they refer to as an X copy deploy, and so X copy deploy was basically a simple way of saying just copy the files in there, and then you're good, right? So Docker is really interesting. If you're not really familiar with how Docker works, under the covers, it really is almost the same thing. They've solved a lot of the similar problems, but basically Docker is saying. If you have these zip files that are, you know, checksummed and all this other stuff to make sure you haven't tampered with it, but if you have these zip files that are unzipped in this order, it will give you the program that we're trying to install exactly correct. And because of the way it works, Docker does not overwrite those files when it goes to unzip them. Technically, it it stacks the files together logically, and that gives you the ability to go back to the drawing board anytime you please. You can actually have two versions of the same app running side by side and neither one of them interferes with the other because they don't know that the other one's there. And so this idea is just really powerful for being able to do this kind of testing. And you're exactly right. It throws away the database state because of the way we're using it, but you can, you can actually create tests that are long running and you can keep the state for a little while. I would be really careful about keeping state that you care about in here until you learn a lot more about how it works. But for test data where you just like the stuff has a fairly short lifespan, I think this is a great fit for testing. Hey John, uh, thank you for the for the talk. I followed along and uh, it's quite quite good. I feel like. Uh, I still have a lot to learn, but by typing and seeing it works on my local machine, uh, that gives me confidence to dig deeper. So it's really good. So the question is around, um, I see this is great for short and sweet, uh, probably unit level or some integration level testing. So what if you say, like you said, there are data that you care about, um, you know, there, if it's a large amount of data, do you 
do you just recreate it every time or how do you deal with that? No, totally great question, right? Um, so it depends on how much data we're talking about, right? Because if you, if you think about it, in my opinion, tests and test automation is about one thing and one thing only, reducing risk, right? So you just have to be uh, uh, diligent about asking yourself, what risk am I trying to reduce and at what cost, right? So when you take that into consideration, you say, okay, well, here's the risk I'm trying to reduce. And the risk is that the program won't work at all, right? And if that, that's the question that you're trying to answer, then maybe what you need is one example or one scenario that shows that the program can work at all. And then you take that amount of data and you bring it in. And so one way to do that is you might export the data into some format, maybe whether it be a backup, whether it be like a table dump, uh, CSV files, what, whatever you decide, right? You dump the data out. And then as part of your, your unit testing, I've actually done this for um, the tests that I've done, even as, as, as unit tests. I'll take the uh, different files that are being uh, imported and I'll dump them straight out of the table and then I'll do a straight load at the beginning of the, the test and I'll just run with that set of data. And you'll go in, you'll see some unit tests where they like painstakingly by hand, like create every row and every, you know, thing in the database with, with special code. I'm too lazy for that. If I've got an example in the database already, that's what I want. I'm going to dump that example out, save it, and then I'm going to write a, a simple command that just like imports that data straight in. And I'll just let that run be right at the beginning of my test. Um, in the case of X unit, you can set it up to run before every test. You can run it before a certain class of tests, so like one test class. Or in the case that it's going to span you for your whole test lifecycle, you could do it at the very beginning of the test and, and just run the test. You could also do order tests, which would give you the confidence to know that even though there's many tests, the test will always run in this sequence. So there's a few different ways that you can kind of solve this problem and keep you from having to like really spend a lot of time and effort trying to push like big volumes of data in. But yeah, I would go so far as to take that data, bring it out as a snapshot and bring it back in. So that every time you do it, the database went from a very empty clean state slate back into being the version that you want so that you can do the tests. And one of the big reasons for that is that if you were to take a database that was like the golden database and you were to export it and then load the database back in. The problem is what I found happens is that people will lose what it took to make that database and it will actually almost become like magic. It'll be like, like, like a weird version of Postgres almost like you have to have this exact file. And then it becomes weird. Like what happens if you need to upgrade to a different version of Postgres? Like all these kinds of concerns become much more weird. But if you just dump it out of straight data, load it back in, like these kinds of problems start becoming non-issues. Very interesting. Thank you. No problem. Uh, John, thank you for your presentation. I have another question. Uh, so if we have speaking about a little bit uh, more complex uh, with small components, how much how much time it will add to test run if we build uh, the system from scratch? From your experience, if you yeah, so great questions, right? Um, so like you're thinking, what happens if I have like a million line app, right? Um, so there's a few things that you can do if you're starting to feel like the cost and the burden for iterating is getting ahead of you and that it's, it's, it's getting to where you don't want to pay that cost on an iteration basis anymore. Um, there's some things that you can do. So remember I was showing you that in uh, the Docker file, um, here, inside of the Docker file, they have this from, and here you can say from this, then do these steps, right? So it's possible for you to take other components and break down your software into smaller chunks and then bring them in modules pre-installed in a Docker image, other things, strategies like that, right? And so at our company, we actually use um, packages. And so by using packages, actually, most of the software does not build while you're doing the build. It may pull down from a repo, but that time to pull down the, the package is a fixed uh, and to, like generally fixed cost per package that you're bringing in. 
So as long as your packages are just not really enormous, it generally doesn't take that long. Um, the other thing that you can do from an iterating basis, if you're not familiar with designing Docker files, you want to design the Docker files in the order that the command is least likely to need to be run again, right? And so what do I mean by that? I'm, what I mean is if I come in and I look at what needs to happen over and over, it should ideally be pushed to the bottom. And so generally, I won't be changing these lines Generally, I'll be changing this line at the bottom. And so the closer to the bottom that your lines are being rerun, Docker is actually smart enough that it will keep a cache of any line that doesn't change, and it will reuse that cache because the Docker file is the same as before. And so this gives you the flexibility to be able to run like much more intensive and to your point, like much more like costly um, uh, processes. Um, but to only have to run them once and then you leverage the cache because that's the same output you want the next time. Does that answer your question or do you have like- yep. uh, Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Yeah, and from a test point of view, you can also do um, like, let's say the cost of running the test is so long. Uh, maybe you have you know a test that takes an hour for whatever reason, right? And you can't get the test down smaller for some you know reason that's out of your control. Um, you could do things like you could take those tests, run them with uh, a lot of these test platforms will have uh, test categories. And then you can say, run the really slow tests, right? And you just choose when you're going to run them. And you could run them, whether it be on a schedule, you could run them based on events, like some code changes in a particular part of your source control. And then maybe you have a trigger uh, based on your Git repo to, to go ahead and run them. Like you could do things like that. And so these would be ways that you could say, these tests are really long running push them off to be run later and you could even parallelize them so like because this is so isolated you could have like let's say the test is so long but you've got three really long tests well you could do three different versions of this docker compose if you had the servers to run them on and you just run them in parallel and that would give you um, a shorter time to completion as well yeah thank you no problem so which which line here that we're looking at, which line puts data into the database? Yeah, so the database is actually upgraded by this um, run test. And so what's happening in this run test that upgrades the database is this command here where it says um, run the migrations and the migrations is going to be done by this DLL, which was set in the previous uh, file here. So it basically take that project, the DLL or the, the class library, and run all of the migrations in it and use this database as the target. So here's the database um, and we're the, the type of the database rather. And then here's the connection string to connect to it. And by putting this in, this is what you're, what you're getting. And so the line, if you will, that's uh, responsible for getting data in would be like each one of these migrations would do it. Now, if you chose to have it as just part of your test, but not part of a migration, um, you could have a line inside of one of your tests that was designed to connect to the database, load this data in and, and that sort of thing. You could certainly do that as well. Um, and then like to the point that I was talking about earlier about like dumping and like importing, Postgres has tools that are like, if you have a table that's been dumped out to a file, you can run them here. So like you could just as easily say, okay, after all the migrations, then um, also, um, you know, run like, I think it's like PG restore, you know, whatever the command is, run that here. All right, thank you. Okay. So um, I, I recognize that this might have been a little bit much. Um, I'm hoping by having the hands-on, it helped. Uh, if anybody has any questions, certainly feel free to hit me up. Uh, I'll go ahead and show my email one more time. Uh, so john at jjgoodwin.com is my personal email. Uh, just be sure to put a subject in, because if it looks like spam, uh, I probably won't respond to it. Um, 
but uh, yeah, just mention the, the the meeting that we had or whatever, and I'll, I'll be glad to answer your question. John, I'm starting to notice that the comments uh, have dwindled and a lot of great questions. So I think that you did hit on a lot of the needs of, of what we have to do on the daily basis. So thank you for putting this all together for us, getting us prepped and getting us engaged in this. This has been really awesome. Um, thank you all for coming. I did go ahead and post a couple of things in the jobs channel, including what John spoke about with the uh, Metabolon jobs. So check those out. And next month, uh, on October 22nd, we don't want to interfere with any of the Halloween uh, costume planning, so we're going to do it early enough. You can do the work stuff and, and then still get to your Halloween. Jenny Bramble is going to be talking to us. So Jenny, you want to give us a little blurb? Sure. Uh, also, hey, John, thanks for coming. You're awesome. Sorry I missed the first part. I do want to hear about your dramatic lighting. Yes, uh, so first off, I really like how Susan thinks I'm not showing up in costume to everything in October. It's cute. Um, what I am planning to talk about next month is kind of the human Im impact of defects. I've worked on a couple of apps recently that are either a user's only way to communicate with the outside world or it's COVID related. Surprise! What do defects mean in this context? It's a different context than if it's a app that you need to use to do something fun like Pokemon Go. Uh, so I want to kind of, I want to talk about a couple of these apps, show them off a little bit, and honestly then have a discussion about what defects can mean in this sort of ecosystem. I would love for people to bring some of their own experiences, and let's have a, let's have a really great interactive discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Jenny. Well, so that we'll do that next month, and thank you all for taking your time. Look for this YouTube posting, uh, I'll, maybe sometime this weekend. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.